So welcome back to the LIBD um, Arstats Club, Liber, Stars, Liber Arstats Club. So a few weeks ago, we started looking at R functions. Um, I know several of us were not and couldn't join us that day. Um, so I'll do a little bit of a recap um, for everyone, although, I mean, there's a video and all of that. Um, if you could go to the spreadsheet, uh, there's, there's a link to this Google Doc that has some of the links that we went through last time. Um, but in particular, there's this presentation that I'm showing on the right called Functional Programming. Um, and so I'll use some slides from that uh, PDF in case you want to download it. Although you can download the full thing from my Dropbox um, through here. So what uh, what we were doing last time was we were learning about R functions and functional programming in R at the same time. And I think this can be really useful not only for those of you that are like going to develop R packages, but also for people doing analysis. Um, and so this is based on a presentation uh, from a course that I took in 2019. The presentation was made by Charlotte Wickham. Um, and uh, I mean, I hear some of the links to here. Uh, some of the later links here were about a data set um, um, called Penguin's data set. Um, and that's because there's a recent movement in the R community to move away from the Iris data set um, because the author of the Iris data set had um, um, eugenic points of view. Um, or beliefs. Um, and so this Penguin's data set is actually quite fun. People have been using it quite a bit lately. Um, the, there's a, at the end of it, there's a link to the code that I wrote interactively during the last session. And so that's a file that I actually downloaded and renamed for today. Um, this is my, the file here. I'll add some stuff um, in case, I mean, if we do any examples. So we can, we can just download those things. Um, so let me do a brief recap of what we were talking about last time uh, before we continue with um, some actual exercises. So um, the idea of writing functions, one, one of the ideas is that it can um, uh, reduce the opportunity for errors. Um, so, um, you copy paste code, which is a common thing to do when you're analyzing data. Um, you're prone to have errors. So in this code on the left side, it might be a bit hard to see, but there's some errors. Like um, if you copy paste it, maybe here you forgot to update this, um, this I to a J, or you made an error here and it was, not, it was supposed to be minus 99, but you uh, wrote it as minus 98. So those are two, two errors there that you have. And um, if you write a little function, you can try to reduce some of that copy and paste, um, uh, you know, the errors related to copy pasting, because here we can um, write a function, do the, um, the same code that we want to do for every column, um, do it here. But like, there's still a lot of copy pasting in this scenario, um, and you can still have errors. So for example, here, we're assigning to the H column, the output from the I column, and that's potentially an error that we wouldn't uh, notice. Um, so um, this is when uh, looping through your functions comes into play. Um, and one of the syntaxes in R for looping is the for cycle, where you specify along like something that you want to loop through. Here we specify that we want to loop um, through I, this is going to be our internal variable, along the columns of our data frame called VF. And for each of those columns, we're going to reassign to that column I the output of our function applied to that same column. So this is, this code does the same thing that this would do, um, like with a, you know, without uh, the errors. Um, and, um, it's something that um, several of you are um, uh, maybe running into now um, at different stages. Um, 
And uh, there's many different ways of actually writing functions, but the first part is to just, um, you know, try to do it for um, anything that you see that you're repeating in your code. Um, so um, we went through the whole example about like baking and how you can simplify recipes um, through this concept of uh, functions where you can say like, okay, we're gonna have uh, some dry ingredients, some wet ingredients, and some specific steps. Um, um, that was, you know, on the video, you can see more of those details when we went through that. Now, um, functions and loops can be hard because here, like you see uh, on this code here, these two pieces of code do basically the same thing, but uh, there's a lot of focus on the art objects, so like empty cars, um, out one, again, empty cars, out one, etc. While the real difference is just that in one case we're computing the mean, and in another one we're computing the median. And a solution for this problem is the per package uh, from the tidyverse. So this is maintained by uh, people at our studio, um, and um, and so that's the other concept that we were learning with these slides, which is uh, the tool that they developed for functional programming. And so here, let's say we want to compute a vector of the means, we can just use the map function to loop through all the columns of the empty cars data set and compute the mean or the median. And so that's, we've reduced a lot that code, made it more human readable. Um, and so let me go through some of the syntax here. Uh, sorry. Um, uh, um, um, Okay, so this is the strategy that they have um, for like learning per. Um, let's say you have a task that you're gonna do and repeat multiple times. So the first um, thing you wanna do is to solve it for a single unit. So in the, it could be a single column or it could be a single variable or something. Um, and so they call it here dot x. Um, that's because of the syntax that the per uh, package uses um, where like dot x is going to refer to a single unit. Then you need to choose the correct map function because there's, um, there's, they have many different ones. And this could be good enough for basically um, nearly everyone here, those first two steps. Um, the third step of simplifying if possible, that's is particularly useful if you're like trying to develop a package because you want to have uh, your code will be as simple as you can. Um, um, it can also help to simplify to in order to explain it to other people, but um, uh, just for getting the task done, you just need steps one and two. Um, and so let's see. Uh, I'm looking through some of the slides. Okay. Um, all right, so this part of the uh, appropriate map function, um, they have a little table here that can be helpful. A map, this, these are functions from the per package. They're gonna loop through things for us. But the idea here is that these different functions return specific outputs. Um, so let's say you're looping through things and you just wanna compute a true or false. So that would be a logical vector. And you would use map underscore, underscore LGL. You wanna compute through things and compute a single number uh, without a decimal, so that would be an integer. Uh, that's uh, underscore int. A double vector, double means like any numeric value that has decimals. So you use underscore DBL. Um, I know this is maybe not as, you need to have a little bit of background on what a double is to understand um, this one. But basically think of double as like any, any decimal number. Um, <clears throat> CHR, which I mean, I always think that it means chromosome, but it actually means character. Um, so this is when you have like text output. You have any type of complicated output, you use the native map function, which is gonna give us a list. Uh, but you might actually be computing something uh, and actually uh, computing a small data frame. So this is actually a scenario that we run into a lot in our work. And, um, and so you might be uh, computing 
like uh, a column. There, um, each time you look through the thing, it might be computing a new column that you want to add and have into a table in the end. Or you might be computing something um, that is actually a row in a table. So this where these two functions come in, map df for data frame, and then it's either c for column or r by row. So these are some of the functions that are quite useful. Um, um, and um, here are just some examples of that that uh, we saw last time. All right. Um, OK. So the, th the thing we did at the end last time was some of these exercises where one of them was to compute the mean in every column of the empty cars data set. Another one was to re re generate 10 random normal values for uh, distributions drawn from either a mean of minus 10, 0, 10, or 100. And then to compute the number of unique values in each column of iris. So to um, check some of those answers, here's uh, one of them. So let's look at compute the mean for every column of the empty cars data set. So um, again, the strategy is to solve it for one column at a time or one unit that you're going to look through things. Um, so in this case, let's look at the first column and they assign it to the dot x object. Why, why assign it to the dot x? Because that's going to be the syntax that we'll use later on in the map functions. So here we have a dot x vector. And what is the function or what is the thing that we need to do to compute the mean? Well, just the mean function, right? So this is um, uh, um, um, a straightforward scenario where we only are using one function. And so once we want to generalize this to the whole empty cars data set, we need to choose the appropriate output. So because we're computing numbers that have decimals, we're going to use the map underscore dbl for double function. And then the syntax is going to be tilde. Uh, and then whatever you're doing that work for one case, you just copy paste it here. So in this case, it was mean um, open parenthesis dot x. Um, there, map and, and that family of functions has a simplified syntax where like if the whatever you're looking through is the only thing that you're fitting into the function you can simplify that without by dropping the tilde syntax um, and dropping the dot x so this is a simplified version but like i said before the generalized version is still like good enough for most cases um, uh, the simplified one is just if you um, want to make your code even more compact. So, um, so here uh, we are doing actually the the um, in, in the simplified scenario we're actually doing like the functional programming. We didn't actually write the function mean here. In the generalized scenario, we did write a function that takes as input a dot x and applies to it the function mean. So this is um, um, uh, well, you know, the base scenario. Um, a more complicated scenario was the one where we had four different input means, and we wanted to compute the 10 random normal values for each of those um, uh, four input means. And so the idea here is, OK, we save into a vector what are our different types of inputs that we're going to look through. So minus 10, 0, 10, and 100. That's part of the task. I didn't find the things that we're going to look through. Then uh, we need to uh, solve this problem for one of them. So in this case, we're going to solve the problem for the first entry in the new vector. We're assigning that to our dot x. What is the solution to compute 10 uh, random uh, normally distributed values from a given mean? Well, the solution for that is using the R norm function that the first argument is n, which specifies the number of um, random samples you want. In this case, we want 10. And then the second argument is mean. Um, and so here, we're going to specify as, as the input mean r dot x. So uh, in order to generalize this, we need to know what is the thing we want to compute. We're actually computing a bit of a complicated output. So we're going to use a map uh, general function. Uh, you could also use the map underscore dfr or the map underscore dfc for data frame column by column or row if you wanted the whole output as a table. Um, so here we're going to loop through it. Uh, our inputs are the mu is the mu vector. 
And to in order to generalize it, we just add the tilde and we copy paste the solution for our one problem, right? For our one scenario. Now you can also simplify this by saying like, okay, we're gonna use the R norm function, uh, but we wanna pre-specify that the n argument is gonna be 10. Uh, but like um, both of them work here, right? Um, <clears throat> now, if you look, I'm not seeing. I'm just gonna open the participants in case people have questions. Um, um, the more uh, this is a bit of a, a more um, involved example um, where we want to compute the number of unique values in each column. Again, we need to start by solving this problem for one column. So we're gonna start with the first column of the iris data set in this presentation or the penguins data set in the code that I sent you. Um, uh, we're assigning it to our dot X. Um, and so we need to find here, the problem is we need to first find the number of unique values. Um, sorry, we need to find the, the unique values and then the number of them. So the function unique in R computes, uh, gives us a vector of the unique options that there are. And the function length will give us um, the number of them, right? So this is a bit of a, 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 a more involved example where we're using two functions. And we can actually generalize this now by just saying uh, the number of unique values is gonna be an integer number, right? It's not gonna be a decimal number. So we're gonna use the map underscore int or integer. We're gonna look through our Iris data set or the Penguins data set. And, um, and then we just, add the tilde and then copy paste the solution that we have for one of them. You wanna, uh, like, this is a, um, a more evolved example. You could actually write a function. So we could define our new function called number of unique that takes, this function takes a next argument and it applies to it the length and the unique functions. So that then becomes um, our solution for one of them would be n unique of dot x we copy paste that into the tilde syntax. It is our generalized solution. And then we can even further simplify by like dropping the tilde and the dot x. Um, now this scenario is, is where, uh, you know, there's, there's a question mark for simplify because is it easier to read or not? Maybe. Um, uh, but this is actually a scenario that gives us the basis for more complicated problems because in more complicated problems, we will write a function for one unit, one input unit, and then look through it. So map is gonna give us the utilities for looking through things um, and, and uh, for making sure that we get consistent output. Um, why do we want consistent output? And that's basically the question of why not base R? Um, a lot of you have seen code we've written because um, we learned how to write R code a while back, particularly Andrew and I, um, and a lot of code we wrote uh, uh, uses uh, the apply family of functions. We use l apply quite a bit, s apply, um, d apply, m apply, uh, all those type of functions. Um, and so, the problem with these functions from base R, uh, in the from the point of view of Charlotte, is that and many other people is that um, these functions, the apply family functions, have an inconsistent order of inputs and they don't necessarily give you the same type of output. So for example, um, uh, as apply is what is called type of stable. It can sometimes give you a matrix, it can sometimes give you a vector as the output. Um, and so if you're actually trying to um, write some code uh, that is general for many types of input, this is gonna become a problem. Why? Because you're gonna run into scenarios where maybe uh, your output is a little bit simpler and then as apply is gonna um, uh, uh, convert it into a, a vector or scenarios where like your input gives you a, a bit of a more complicated scenario and as apply is gonna return to you a matrix. Um, and so if you're trying to combine results from multiple of those inputs, this is gonna become harder for you to, to work with. And so, I mean, there, there are ways for dealing with this and we, and we do it, uh, but, um, but MAP and PER 
uh, is going to make it easier. Um, um, now, this uh, third bullet point about requiring functions, I'm a, like, I don't really care that much about that. It's like, if you use per, you can type less. Um, but uh, uh, you're actually doing functions even, even though you're typing less with per sometimes. Um, so <clears throat> there's other things that they did uh, in the per package. There's a function called walk. The, the walk uh, uh, functions are similar to map, but they're just looping through something and like printing messages. They're not actually altering any data. Um, so that is something you cannot really do as easily with S apply and those functions. So um, this actually takes quite a bit of work learning this per syntax and practicing it. Um, I know a lot of you use uh, apply and S apply. Um, I occasionally still think because I've been doing it so much, sometimes it's easier for me to write code in S apply or L apply syntax than to do it on the map syntax. Um, but uh, I've seen a lot of other people uh, switch to per and, um, and it can have a lot of uh, payoff. Um, um, so just to consider a little bit more, um, uh, some of the differences here is that uh, S apply or V apply as one input and can give you a scalar. Um, uh, M apply can have an infinite number of inputs and can will also give you a scalar. Um, L apply will have one type of input and the output can be really anything. It's going to be a list. That's why, that's why the name is L apply, list apply. Um, while the per, um, the per package has many more functions. It has all the map functions that take a single input and will give you one type of output, so a logical integer, double, or character, um, two inputs, or n number of inputs. Um, and then uh, if you want general outputs, that's either map, map two, or key map. Um, and if you don't want any outputs, then they have walk, walk two, and key walk. Um, so that's where in like, if you look at the uh, per package, you'll see a bunch of functions and it might be a little bit easy to get lost on what they are, although they try to have a very common syntax like, like underscore LGL is going to be for like the logical output, um, uh, whether it has no number or a two or a P is going to be where like the, the number inputs is one, two or N. Um, um, so let's look a little bit at pair map. So pair map is this scenario where you have two inputs of the same length. Um, like one common scenario could be like you have, um, let's say the columns of a data frame and also the names of those columns, right? Um, and so map to the idea here is that you want to run the same function as to each pair of inputs. So here, the light ones first, um, you know, the medium light ones, then the uh, light dark ones, and then the fully dark ones, right? Um, so that's the idea of these map two functions. Um, <clears throat> that changes a little bit what we need to do. Uh, so instead of solving for a single dot x, now we need to solve for a single dot x and a dot y. So you need to have two inputs. Uh, and then instead of uh, generalizing with a map function, we, we now need to use a map to function. Um, and again, we can simplify if necessary. So <clears throat> here's one example. So using the ggplot2 package. So uh, this split command is going to break up the diamonds data frame into multiple data frames based on the color uh, column. Um, and so we're going to get a list of inputs by color. Um, and then let's say we want to have uh, a list of file names. So we're going to get all the names of the unique colors and combine and um, combine to them the .csv file extension. So now we have two inputs. We have a, a list of inputs of, of data frames, which is this by color object. 
and a list of uh, character vectors um, that has names that are the path that is a paths um, uh, ve uh, vector. So let me let me run that on R in R. Um, Paste, yeah. Um, just so you can see how it looks. Um, so <coughs> if I check the class of my code, it's going to be a list. Uh, Let me load also the per package. Um, I can look through that uh, by color a list and ask what are the classes of the objects inside of it. Um, and it turns out that I have uh, data frames in each of them. Um, I could actually make this into a little table by combining them by row, if r, right? So now we have, um, yeah, each of them is a data frame, yeah. Um, so, uh, so that's our input here by color. Now paths is just gonna be a set, uh, it's a character vector. Uh, I'm gonna move this same thing, getting in my way. Um, okay. Uh, so paths is just a character vector here. The thing is, the length of both of them is going to be identical. Uh, so we have the same length, and they're actually paired, right? Like the first path is d.csv. Uh, the first table is also the d table. I mean, this is we designed it that way, right? By this code. And so now we're in the scenario where uh, we have two inputs of the same length and they're paired with each other. So this is where we can start using the map two functions. So we need to first sol for solve our problem for just a single pair of dot x's and dot y's. Um, let me just save some of the code that I wrote. Um, Um, so in order to solve that for one, we just need to create these dot X and these dot Y arguments. Um, so we're accessing the by color um, list and the path uh, character vector and just obtaining the first element using the double square bracket, square, square bracket syntax. If I look at dot x, it's going to be a data frame. Um, doesn't matter how big that data frame is. It's just we know it's a data frame. And dot y is going to be the name, right? The, the uh, where I want to write the file. So how do I actually write the CSV uh, file output? Well, there's a function write the CSV, which um, that will be our solution here. Um, now, you might not remember what write.csv does, so we might need to check the help file. And um, uh, write.csv actually has an argument called x and the one called file. So x is going to be the object that you want to write, like either um, matrix or data frame. We have a data frame called our dot x. And the file, that's a character screen of where you want to write the file. So this becomes write.csv. x is going to be little x. I mean dot x, and then five is going to be dot y. Um, if you already remember that, like if you're, if you knew already that that's the um, argument names and the order, uh, you could also have written it in this more succinct way. Um, but both of them, I think, are useful. And I actually prefer sometimes like um, like uh, having explicit argument names. Um, 
that way uh, your code is more readable for other people that might not know exactly what are the order of the arguments in the write.csv function. Um, so that's the solution here for writing one of them. Like if I run this function um, and check my files, I now have a dot .csv um, table. Um, um, so, <clears throat> so now we can generalize this using the map to uh, uh, function from per. And so we need to give it uh, the object where we're going to loop through, and that's going to, the first object is going to be our dot x. So I use by color above um, as a dot x. And then we need our object that we're going to loop through for our dot y's. So that will be paths. And then we need to paste um, the, scene, the solution that we had for our single problem using the dot tilde syntax. So I'm just going to paste that there. Um, and so now I have a full like um, uh, functional programming solution. And if I run it, um, it's actually creating all these files for me. Um, now here you finished, and you can see on the left side in my R console, I got some output. And maybe I don't actually needed that output, right? Maybe I just, um, the main output for me was not something in the R console, it was something I wanted as files, right, outside. And so that's where the concept of the walk functions come into play. There's walk without number, walk with a two, and walk with n. And so I'm just gonna copy the solution that I had above. Um, let me delete these files, because I wanna remake them. Um, um, uh, so I'm gonna copy the solution that we had uh, and instead of using map to, I want to use walk to. It's the same exact syntax, um, and it's like looping and creating these files. Um, but in the end, I don't actually need any output on the R console. So a walk to doesn't print anything for me um, because the main output for me were, were the files. So um, that's you know the, the quick introduction to walk. Uh, versus uh, versus um, map to. Um, you can always simplify this uh, because the write.csv function, the first argument is the x argument where we're feeding dot x. The second argument is file where we're feeding dot y. So um, because of that, we can actually remove the dot tilde syntax and everything inside these parentheses. Um, and get the exact same result. Now, you, you can see here that um, uh, if you want to write code that is this short, you need to write functions um, and have arguments that go in the same order as the, what the function is taking in. Um, and so this will be important when you're writing your own functions later on um, to make sure um, that you have your arguments in the same exact order. Um, because this wouldn't, if I switch the order of paths and by color, that would not work at all. Um, this would not work at all. Uh, uh, because now I'm fitting um, a character vector to a data frame and write CSV is like, what? I don't know how to deal with that. Um, you could always use this, um, if I switch them around. Mm -hmm. If I switch them around, I also need to switch them around in, in the write.csv syntax here, right? So now I have a mismatch between the order of the inputs and the arguments for write CSV. So I need to actually use the full tilde syntax. Um, so this is just something to keep in mind when you're writing your own functions. Uh, because um, um, uh, maybe maybe you're okay with like the syntax that I have in line 62, or maybe you prefer the syntax from line 59, right? Um, uh, uh, depending which one is more human readable for you, 
um, this will make a change, right, in how you write your code later on. Um, cool. Um, so, um, so if you want an actual output in the R console, use the map functions. If you just want something outside of R, use the walk functions. So maybe you're like, your function is like uploading data. And you know, in that case, you might just use the walk function. Um, uh, but maybe it's computing something, then you want the map function. <clears throat> so this, this set of slides was part of a course on how to build our packages. And it has some examples with that, some that I'm gonna skip a bit. Um, um, so, um, let's look at this part of type stability. This is just, um, they're making argument for using the per functions instead of using the base R functions. So let me just copy this code and, uh, let's do this exercise here. So. Uh, we're building a data frame called the F. Let me just print it so you can see it, look at it. This data frame has a single row and four columns. One of them is called A, B, Y, and Z. Uh, first column seems to be a, an integer number, then we have a digit number, then like a date, and then another, uh, something that actually prints like a number, but it's a factor. Uh, the, the order function is um, one of the functions that creates a factor object. So if I look at class df z, uh, we see that it's a factor. Um, so I get integers, um, POSIX x is, um, is um, a time. Right, um, so this here I'm looping through the math function. Now, um, <clears throat> this exercise here is like, um, is gonna showcase that you can get different things depending on the inputs using the same exact code of S apply. Um, so, um, can any of you guess what's gonna be the output of each of these three lines? I'll just run it then. Um, so here, if we use as apply and ask um, uh, what is a class for each of the four inputs, we get a list here, uh, output. Why do we get a list? because each object is um, not of the same length. So S apply is not combining them into a single vector or a table. So we get a list that says like, oh, the first column is named A and is a type integer. Second one is called B and is a type numeric. The second one is called Y and is like type uh, POSIX, POSIX CT and POSIX T. And the fourth one is called Z and it's an order and also a factor. Now, if, I, if we just look through the first two, A and B, these two are gonna have the same length and we're actually gonna get a named vector. So if I just print it, this is how it looks. So as apply in one scenario, return the list, which look, look at it, a list like that. In another scenario, you return the vector. Uh, just because the input was simpler, and so it gave us different types of output. If we look at the second scenario where we have um, columns Y and Z that have two, two types of classes associated with them, S apply is now gonna return to us a matrix. Um, um, so that's, we can get, the first scenario, we get a list. Second scenario, we get a vector. Third scenario, we get a matrix. So those are three very different types of R uh, objects. And you might say like, ah, this doesn't matter as much, right? Because uh, uh, I got the information I needed. And so this 
will matter if uh, you want your code to run for multiple types of input and not crash when the input changes. Um, and that's where we want to use uh, type stable functions. Um, and so the idea of a type stable function is that it always gives you the same type of output regardless of what the input was. So it will always give you like, for example, a logical vector or a data frame or a list or you know something that you know how to handle and that makes it easier to build um, nested functions nested functionality um, um, and so <clears throat> map will either give you lists or it dies as apply well we already saw that it changes depending on what type of input you have etc um, 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 this is before our point. This last column is before our 4.0, so I'll ignore that. Okay. Um, so what can you do? Uh, so for example, um, uh, we can use the map chr uh, function. So let me just copy that code and see what map will give us in this scenario. So here is like, oh, I don't know how to deal with that. Here is like, oh, here you have a character vector. And this scenario is like, oops, I don't know how to deal with that scenario either, right? Um, and uh, why is that? Well, like um, our function uh, class just giving us like multiple types of output. So it's a bit complicated, right? Um, and so we would need to write off um, a little bit more of a, a more general code that would work with any of those um, outputs. Um, so uh, we can either do it like by uh, changing the function that we're feeding to map or changing the map function that we're using and just assume that we're always going to work with a list, right? Um, so let's. I'm just gonna try one. Uh, let's see if this works. It's a, I would need to spend a bit more time uh, trying to make a more general solution for that. Um, anyway, I'll ignore that for now. Um, all right, so um, uh, one common scenario that we run into a lot um, in base R using this uh, L apply functions is when you want to subset something. So let's say here we're uh, doing a data frame and we're finding which of the columns of that data frame are numeric columns and subsetting those columns using the square bracket comma syntax. What is what is a problem with this type of functionality is that um, if you give a data frame that has like zero columns or, um, or some other things, uh, is gonna fail completely. Um, and that's because the square bracket syntax actually has an argument that a lot of people don't use, which is the drop argument. Um, and whether you use that argument will change the output of the square bracket syntax. You can change it from a matrix or data frame into a vector. Um, so that's why like a lot of SAPI functions will fail or like apply family function calls can fail because of this drop argument. Um, so this is where like sometimes grinding functions can get a little complicated because you have to think of what is always going to be true in your case, right? What is never going to change and you need to write your function that way. So this is a bit of a thought exercise that will be different from maybe things you've been doing in the past. Um, and um, 
I would just encourage you to just uh, you know try, but like, um, but also don't worry if your functions are long, right? There's a lot of focus in these slides about simplifying code. Um, I think first of all, like you want functions, even if they're long, will help you with a lot of the problems that we saw in the earlier slides about um, uh, copy pasting errors. Um, and as you practice more and more making these functions, you're gonna get better at identifying these invariants, right? And also at simplifying your code. Uh, but this is this is like practice, I think, um, and uh, and then you'll see that there's many ways of doing this. But um, 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 yeah, let me. I think that's everything in these slides. Um, the last slide here includes to um, includes a couple links, um, including um, a cheap a cheat sheet on the per package. Um, which, if you if you want to give per a, a go, I highly recommend this um, this cheat sheet because it has a lot of like nice diagrams showing you like okay, map has an input that is like you know one list, map two has like two of them, p map has like multiple of them, etc. Um, and like uh, what they do and things like that. Um, and there's more like um, there's a lot more complicated scenarios here where you'll deal with like um, like complicated output too. Um, yeah, but in a lot of cases, we're just computing a single number through units that we look through, like let's say that mean for each column of a data frame, or we're computing like some summary information that we can put into the table, right? Let, let's say we're computing, uh, Let's say we're looping through each chromosome and we're computing the number of re reads the line to that chromosome, the number of expressed genes. Uh, and that's like a little table that just needs two columns, right? Things like that. And so I think we can get a lot of out of this per uh, package. Um, and uh, if you've ever struggled with the apply family functions, per promises to be more um, human readable and understandable um, and less, um, also more predictable because it's it, it always gives you the same type of output. Um, so these are functions I would recommend checking. Those are basically the ones I use from the per package. I don't actually know a lot of, about these other ones, uh, but um, uh, but maybe you can also teach us at some later point how to use these other functions in the cheat sheet um, uh, if you run into more complicated scenarios. The modify functions that actually might be quite useful because see here's like okay I just want to change a column let's say if it's um if it's a number or if it's um, uh, an integer or something like that um, or if um, it has at least like ten unique values um, so this is where like the modify functions can be become useful um, cool um, so let me stop recording. Um, stop.